The monarch butterfly is one of God's incredible creations. With a wingspan of nearly 10 centimeters, the monarch is one of the largest butterflies outside of the tropics. Most people recognize the beautiful orange, black, and white wings of the monarch as its habitat extends all the way around the globe. The migrating monarch of North America can travel farther and live longer than any other known butterfly. Flower nectar is the monarch's food source. It uses its long, hollow tongue to sip flower nectar. When not drinking, this tongue is curled up. The monarchs of North America have an amazing life cycle. They spend the winter resting on trees in a semi-hibernating state down in Mexico, Guatemala, Southern California, and Florida. In spring, their internal clock will tell them to begin to fly north towards their birthplace. In four or five weeks, the reproductive organs will develop and they'll begin to search for a mate. The male monarch has a special gland that he projects from his abdomen. This gland produces a flower-like scent that the female can detect up to two miles away. He'll transfer some of the scent to the two dark spots on his rear wings. Then as he fans his wings around a female, she's mesmerized by the scent filling the air. Male monarchs often appear to fight when a female is nearby. Male monarchs produce sperm cells. Females produce egg cells. These two cells must combine to produce the monarch caterpillar, or larva. When a pair come together, or mate, the male will pass some of his sperm cells to the female. Mating monarchs may remain together for several hours. If they're disturbed or threatened, the male can fly away carrying the female. The female monarch usually mates before her eggs are mature. She'll hold the male sperm in a special pouch in her abdomen. When an egg is ready, she'll pass it over this pouch, and one sperm will enter the tiny hole at the top of the egg. This hole also allows oxygen and moisture to reach the newly developing caterpillar. Before laying her eggs, the female will test the plant. She'll tap it and prick it with tiny needles on her front feet. 
Then she'll smell the juice with her antenna and taste it with taste sensors on her other feet. If the plant is suitable, she'll glue a single egg, usually to the underside of the leaf. A female monarch can lay up to 700 eggs in her lifetime. The monarch will only lay its egg on a milkweed type of plant. Luckily, there's over 2,400 different varieties of milkweed in the world. This particular one is called sand vine, and it's quite common in the Cincinnati area. Some monarchs will make it back to their birthplace. Some females from as far north as Canada will begin laying their eggs along the way. Butterflies from these eggs, laid in early spring and summer, will develop quickly and then continue towards the parent's birthplace. Often it's the children, grandchildren, or even great-grandchildren that make it back to the North homeland, a place they've never seen before. Here's an egg on the back of a sand vine leaf. This tiny egg contains all the genetic information necessary for the development of the caterpillar, chrysalis, and butterfly, as well as information that tells the butterfly when to migrate south, when to return north, the location of the overwintering site, and the birthplace. The egg the first day is kind of a whitish color, but the second day becomes a little more yellow. By the third day, the eggs have a slightly gray color because you can see the black head of the caterpillar through the egg. Once the eggs hatch, the first thing the caterpillar eats is the eggshell. Here's a caterpillar hatching out of his egg. The caterpillar is going to spend the next 12 to 17 days doing little else but eating. By the second day, you can see the black stripes on the little caterpillars. Even though the caterpillar's skin is very thin and stretchy, because it gains so much weight over these days, it has to shed its skin several times. This caterpillar, which is about three days old, has shed its skin for the first time. After it sheds its skin, it turns around and eats it. By the fourth day, the yellow lines on the caterpillar are now visible. They'll continue eating and eating and eating.
This caterpillar has just shed his skin for the second time. To shed its skin, the caterpillar places a small pad of silk on the leaf. He grabs onto that with the rear legs. Then he makes a small silk pad that he holds onto with his front legs. After the skin loosens, he pulls himself forward and walks out of the skin. Now he'll go back and eat the skin. You can see the tiny head capsule that's still lying on the front of the leaf. This capsule is made of chitin, which is very hard. The caterpillar cannot eat this. When the caterpillar sheds its head capsule, it is essentially throwing away its eyes and the hollow tube called the spinneret that the silk comes through. After about two hours, the new skin on the caterpillar will harden and he'll be able to see again. Caterpillars only see the difference between light and dark. This caterpillar has already loosened its head capsule as it gets ready to shed. Shedding is also known as molting. The monarch caterpillar will molt four or five times. In between molts, the caterpillar is known as an instar. You can see the caterpillar flexing as he prepares to walk out of his old skin. Now the caterpillar just has to wait for its new skin to dry. He'll use his front feet to finally remove the old head capsule.
here's a look at the head capsules left over from two different sheddings. As a defense, if the caterpillar is disturbed, it will curl into a ball, often falling off of the plant and into the tall grass for protection below. Milkweed is poisonous to many small creatures. When the monarch caterpillar eats the leaves, some of this poison will remain in its body, even as an adult butterfly. For this reason, some birds will avoid eating the monarch caterpillar and butterfly. God has specially designed the monarch caterpillar to eat and digest only milkweed plants. Monarch caterpillars are not a threat to our crops and the adult butterfly helps to pollinate plants as it drinks flower nectar. With the exception of a short rest before and after shedding its skin, the caterpillar spends its days and nights eating and growing. and eating and growing. And eating and growing and occasional shedding and eating and growing When the caterpillar is full grown, about 20 days after the egg was laid, it weighs an amazing 2,700 times what it weighed when it crawled out of the egg. Here you can see a full grown caterpillar next to a two day old caterpillar. This weight gain would be equivalent to a seven pound baby growing to 18,900 pounds in just 20 days. Once the caterpillar is full grown, it stops eating and changes begin inside its body. It walks quickly about, searching for a suitable site to become a pupa or chrysalis. Once it finds a suitable location, he'll spend several hours spinning a silk pad.
When the silk pad is complete, the caterpillar turns around and will grab onto the silk pad with his last two legs, called claspers. The caterpillar slowly releases his grip with all but the last legs holding on to the silk pad. It will hang upside down in this J position for about 12 hours while changes continue inside its body. During this time, the caterpillar remains relatively quiet, although you can sometimes see him curl his upper body and watch movements as they go from his head to his feet. He's preparing to shed his skin one last time. The skin splits just behind the caterpillar's head and the green chrysalis is revealed. The caterpillar jerks and wiggles, pushing the skin up towards the silk pad. Both the legs and the head capsule are removed as the skin folds up, leaving the caterpillar completely blind. As the skin moves up closer to the claspers, a small black stalk called a cremaster protrudes through a hole in the abdomen. The end of the cremaster is covered with hooks, just like Velcro. Velcro is man's copy of God's original design for gripping.
the blind caterpillar lunges the cream master into the silk pad, twisting it until it holds tight so that the claspers can be shed with the skin. The caterpillar will do all kinds of twists and movements to release the skin. Now the chrysalis will compact until it's just half the length of the caterpillar. In a few hours, the soft chrysalis will dry and become a thin protective shell with about 24 brilliant gold dots on the outside. Most of the internal parts of the caterpillar have turned into a clear green liquid, but just behind the row of 24 gold dots near the top is a small heart that continues to beat 60 times per minute and will become part of the butterfly's heart. There are 14 additional gold spots around the bottom of the chrysalis. The chrysalis shell is like a blueprint or pattern to guide the cells that will make up the butterfly over the next eight days. On the outside, you can see the veins of the wings these wing cells began to develop inside the caterpillar's body when it was less than a centimeter long. From the first through the fifth day, the chrysalis looks the same on the outside, but inside the butterfly cells are being organized. On the sixth day, some dark areas are visible through the chrysalis below the row of gold dots. And on the seventh day, the wings are visible. On the eighth day, most of the chrysalis appears black because the butterfly inside is complete. You can see the orange and white of the wings through the thin shell. The butterfly usually emerges from the chrysalis early in the morning. If it's raining, the butterfly can stay inside the shell for up to five days. The monarch will push with its four large legs until the chrysalis cracks open. Then it will push its abdomen out the front and slide out the back while it grips the shell.
Now the butterfly will pump fluid from its abdomen into its tightly folded wings. In about 15 minutes, the wings will expand to their full size. A few hours in the sun will dry the wings, and after a couple of test flaps, the monarch is able to fly away and drink nectar from flowers with its long hollow tongue. Unlike the caterpillar, the butterfly can see all the colors of the rainbow and ultraviolet light. This is a male. You can see the two dark spots called alar glands on his rear wings. Females don't have these spots. The wings of the male monarch are a brighter orange than the females. This is a female. Female monarchs are usually smaller than males, and the veins in their rear wings are thicker. Most monarchs live for two to six months, but the butterflies that emerge in early fall are the generation that will migrate south. They can live eight, nine months, or even longer, and travel up to 2,000 miles to the family wintering site. Before the reproductive organs develop, their internal clock will tell them to begin their southern journey to a place they've never seen before. Next spring, these butterflies will return north, and with the laying of their eggs, will begin this amazing life cycle all over again. Studying other migrating birds and insects has given us some clues about how the monarch may navigate. It's believed the monarch uses the Earth's magnetic field and the sun's position as guides. The monarch can see ultraviolet or polarized light, so even on a cloudy day the butterfly can determine the sun's position from a patch of blue sky. The monarch also has tiny ferric oxide crystals called magnetite in its head and chest. These crystals can detect the Earth's magnetic field. The complex genes, internal clock, and tiny computer-like navigational brain that God has blessed the monarch with will interpret this information to tell the butterfly when to migrate, in which direction to head, where the winter destination is located, and direct it back towards its birthplace next spring. The monarch butterfly is truly an incredible creation whose complexity and beauty glorify its creator God.
If you'd like to read more about the monarch butterfly, check out From Darkness to Light to Flight by Jules Poyer. Or his children's book, The Life and Adventures of Monica Monarch.